because I don't have much choice. Um, I, I'm Reverend Shane Capps, I'm the Minister of Pastoral Care uh, and new members here at Emmanuel, and I want to welcome everybody. Um, we are so uh, happy to, to have you here and uh, especially um, to welcome our guests and speakers um, from PFLAG. Uh, when the staff talked about doing a workshop that each week we were uh, rolling over to a new um, uh, area of concern for people, one of the first things that came up was, uh, was uh, transgender um, sensitivity. And so uh, I contacted, I looked on the the website and contacted Catherine Hyde and was delighted that she responded very quickly. Um, Catherine is uh, the director of the uh, Howard County. No, I'm I'm the uh, tran uh, I'm Mid Atlantic Regional Director for P Flag. Okay, so. she, but she has been doing this and going all over uh, the world. You, you, <laughs> As a matter of fact, yes. Of fact, <laughs> um, in order to do some of these workshops, and uh, we are. Very happy to have her, and think that this is a really important thing to do as a church. So, um, if you would join with me in welcoming her, and thank you. She will the other thank person. you. Sure, absolutely. Um, Hunter, Hunter Thompson is a member of Howard County P Flag as well, and Hunter does this presentation with me. We've been doing it for six years now, yeah. right? I think it has been. Yeah. So, yeah, um, Hunter uh, facilitates our uh, support group for adult trans folks at um, Howard County PFLAG. I facilitate the support group for parents of little trans folks. Um, so, thanks for coming. And Joanne is here. Joanne's a PFLAG mom from PFLAG Baltimore County. So she's here to help us and support us. And shall I leave it at that? Okay, Andrew's here as well. <laughs> It's Joanne's, Joanne's son is here with us, so. Okay, so um, this is gonna be very informal. We do a little bit of storytelling, a little bit of definitions. We're gonna watch a little bit of movie, play a game. I hit you wherever your learning style is, we're gonna hit you, okay? So don't, don't feel neglected. Plenty of time for Q&A, interrupt any time. Um, very laid back. So um, I'm gonna do some definitions first. We're gonna start with gender assignment. And this is that box that they checked on your birth certificate, right? And if you'll think back to this experience, it's really just a visual check of genitals that triggers that box that's checked, right? Um, and also to keep in mind that we do have a fair number of people who are born with what's considered um, ambiguous genitalia. So they're not really clear and they have to do some other tests to kind of figure out where on the spectrum those people, those young people fall. Um, gender identity, on the other hand, is based on your internal sense of who you are, your maleness, your femaleness, whether you feel like you're a little bit of both. Some people don't feel like they're really either, you know. So what the people say is that your gender assignment was between your legs, your gender identity is between your ears, right? So um, according to the American Pediatric Association, gender identity is, is something, children are the ones doing gender work, if you think about it, right around ages two, three, and four, they're focused on I'm going to be a mommy when I grow up and I want to play with dolls or I want to play with guns and trucks. So, and the American Academy of Pediatrics say that it's right around, usually by about age four or five, our gender identity for most of us is pretty clear and pretty solid, pretty well defined. Gender expression, on the other hand, is really how we carry our gender, right? That's how we dress, that's how we walk, that's whether we prefer short hair, long hair, skirts, pants, high heels, tennis shoes, jeans, all of that, and how we gesture and speak. When we talk in schools about bullying, it's the gender expression that's getting bullied, right? They'll use a word around sexual orientation. They'll say, if a little boy swishes, they'll say, oh, you must be gay. But that's not what they're talking about because most six-year-olds don't know if they're gay or not yet, right? But how they walk is kind of inherent to who they are and what they prefer to wear, whether that's pink or blue or camo or frilly socks, whatever it is. That's kind of baked in the cake and that's what children pick on when they're bullying in school, is that gender expression. A lot of us assume that gender expression means can be tied to sexual orientation. I often do this presentation with another woman who has pretty much the same gender expression I do. Glasses, no contacts, no makeup. I used to have short hair, I'm growing it out, I don't know what the hell came over me, but I used to have short hair, she has short hair, we both like jeans and tennis shoes, and I would say, looking at us, can you tell our sexual orientation? 
And those people acknowledge, well, no, you really can't. But when I go to a pride parade, if I don't have my PFLAG mom sticker on, I get hit on because I have an expression that people make an assumption about my sexual orientation. And my partner who I do this with, she's a lesbian and I'm straight. So uh, just to let you know, gender expression is not the key to sexual orientation. They're separate parts of our, our personality. And sexual orientation, some people uh, confuse that with gender as well. Gender is about what's in here, my gender identity. My sexual orientation is about what's out there. And what, and we call it, I, at PFLAG, I like to call it romantic orientation. Because I hate to break it to you, gay people don't have any more or less sex than the rest of us do. It's pretty, you know, it's not just about sex. Who we fall in love with is about our heart, right? And we often fall in love with people, well, I won't go there. <laughs> so transgender is an umbrella term for everybody in, in, whose internal sense of their identity doesn't necessarily match what the doctor said on their birth certificate. And it's a big umbrella term. It even encompasses people who might consider themselves queer. That's a term that the young people are taking back and taking ownership of and saying, I'm not completely male, I'm not completely female, I'm queer, I'm somewhere in the middle, or I'm, I'm gender fluid, and that trans umbrella term encompasses all of us. Um, you'll see, I'm gonna hand this out, you'll see when I hear, I actually put the word on here, flaunting, and this, this presentation dates back six years, Hunter and I were talking about how long we've been doing this. I'm parent to an almost 22-year-old trans girl who transitioned seven years ago. And one of the things that she was the first kid in Howard County Schools to transition, she transitioned male to, male to female. And one of the counselors said, like, okay, I get it that Will likes to wear girls' clothes, but why does he have to flaunt it? So I actually defined flaunting on here because it, it just so angered me. We don't say that, a, that a, an athlete is flaunting it when he's wearing his gear, right? and running around looking all so wonderful. I mean, no, we built him a stadium and fundraised to put lights on it, right? But my kid, who wanted to wear a pink tube top, but because they thought my kid was a boy, somehow that's flaunting. So, so when you see it on here, that's just a mommy's being angry. <laughs> so here's some questions to ask yourself. When did you first realize that you were a girl or a boy? And how did you know? And what would you have done if they told you you were wrong? That's kind of crazy making, right? You know, you know. Why are you disagreeing with me, right? I want to talk to you about, uh, tell a story about my husband and me to illustrate the difference between someone who's gender solid, really clear, like Little Miss Purple Sparkles and the, oh, she's very gender clear <laughs> when we were eating dinner, and someone who's a little bit more gender fluid. I unfortunately have to give away my age so that you have the social context. I was born in 1958, so when I was six years old, if you had told me, Catherine, we were wrong, you're a guy, my response would have been yippee skippy, right? It, it, it was 1963, I knew three things, I knew my father had more power in the house than my mother did. My, my sisters and I had more chores than our brothers did, right? And I could have been ball boy at Memorial Stadium for the Orioles, which they didn't let girls do and was the height of my six-year-old ambition. So if you had said to me, we got it wrong, kiddo, you're really a boy, I'd have been fine, absolutely fine. I grew up, I went through puberty. As I was growing up, the world for women was exploding. I discovered women had their own kind of power, after all. <laughs> I got through puberty, I became comfortable being a woman. I grew up and I'm relatively comfortable in the gender roles as a female, right? My husband, I'm convinced though, if I grew up a guy, I'd have been perfectly happy doing that. I'd have been a gay guy though, because I really like boys. I'm sorry, I just like boys. Uh, my husband, on the other hand, was born through five years before me in 1953 and came out of the womb playing toy soldier. This guy was shooting and killing anything that moved from the moment he was born. He grew up, he did a tour in the Marines. He is a boy's boy, right? If you had said to him at age five or six, 
John, we got it wrong, you're really a girl, he would not have said yippee skippy, right? That wouldn't be. It would be, ew, ew, cooties, <laughs> right? That guy is gender solid. I'm a little bit more gender fluid. There's people who's a lot more gender fluid than I am, right? They can move in and out and feel and express in and out of one gender or the other, or don't feel like they really belong. So I just want to get this, this, this kind of, does that help you guys understand that? Because one of the things we talk about when we have trans people, some of them are gender solid, and some trans people are a little bit more gender fluid. And it may take them a little bit longer to figure out which box do they really belong in. I don't think so. I think tomboys are because we, we allow and encourage girls to be forceful like boys. Um, I think if they grow up and they're uncomfortable in their girl skin and it's no longer tomboys, I think that's when it becomes more of the umbrella trans piece. Um, when you think about it, we do give girls ex exceptional amounts of space, right? We don't give boys any space. The moment a boy puts on a tutu, the whole family is up in arms, right? And that's my, and that's my story. I'll take a moment to tell you that now. Um, I wanted a boy desperately when I was pregnant. And we had one. We had what I thought was a boy. The doctor said he was a boy. That was supposed to be it, right? Named him after both of the grandfathers, William Thomas Hyde Gallucci, as guy, guy a name as you could get. Around age three, William started an only child, so there were no girl things in the house. I certainly didn't have a lot of them either, you know. William started gravitating toward his cousin's tutu and anything pink and sparkly. And my husband and I were horrified. This was, Will was born in 1993, so this would have been around 1996. We were horrified. We went to a psychologist who told us to discourage girl play and encourage boy play. Now, if you think about that and unpack that, what that ends up doing is shaming the child. No, you can't have a Barbie doll. No, you can't do that. Boys don't do that. Don't walk that way. Boys don't walk that way. Um, we took the kid to karate where at the time, Hunter was the manager of the karate place. And you know, little did we know we'd reconnect so many years later. Um, and Will hated it. By age six, Will was threatening suicide. Will had said to me, Mommy, something went wrong in your belly. I was supposed to be a girl. And I said, oh no, I've seen your parts. You're definitely a boy. But when the suicidal ideation came out, we went back to a psychiatrist who said, your kid might be gay, which is a little bit extreme for a six-year-old, um, and also did not talk to us about gender identity. So we continued to discourage boy play and encourage girl play. The psychiatrist also told us that Will had depression and anxiety. I couldn't figure out how a six-year-old could be suffering from depression and anxiety. But we learned how to parent a depressed, anxious, angry child. Um, we eventually, and Will went to a very dark place, an extremely dark place. Will lived online, all of the avatars were female, and Will hated us. And John and I could not figure out why. We were perfectly reasonable, laid back, loving parents, accommodating on everything except that gender thing. And little did we know how incredibly important that gender thing is. So Will started cutting, um, self-medicating, suicide attempts. At age 15, by the time Will was 15, Will had come out as being attracted to boys. And at age 15, as a coming of age, we moved Will from the upstairs bedroom to the basement. And I finally gave up on all the gender expression stuff. I said, okay, you can decorate this room any way you want. Well, I had the pinkest, pompomiest bedroom in the state of Maryland, I swear. The walls were the color of a Victoria's Secret bag. There were pom-poms around the bed, beads around the curtain, Hello Kitty liberally dispersed throughout. There was a round mirror with a pink boa stuck to it and a button that's pushed. It said, you are beautiful. This was the kid's bedroom. While we were in the pink paint fest, Will and I got into a fight and I lost, and, and oh, this was before the fight, Will said to me, mom, I have the best of both worlds. I'm a guy on the outside and a girl on the inside. And I had no idea what to do with that phrase. I mean, this was supposed to be a stage. They promised me it was a stage, and here my 15-year-old was still talking to me this way. And I did not know how to deal. 
then we had a fight a few days later over something, God knows what. My husband calls us itchy and scratchy. We're always, we're way too much alike to live in the same house. Um, and during that fight, I screamed at Will, the finger up and everything. She's taller than I am. You can be as gay as you want, but if you go trans on me, it's on your own time, your own money, and out of my house. I didn't understand what transgender was. I thought it was something that perverse people did to themselves. A couple days later, I was sitting in a car wash, a couple days, a couple weeks later, four weeks later about, I was sitting in a car wash in Howard County Center Park Drive. You know how you're kind of back in the womb when you're in a car wash? There's water all around and you're, there's nothing to distract you. And I was listening to Ira Glass with that wonderful mesmeric voice on This American Life on NPR, and he was talking about transgender kids, and he was inter interviewing a six-year-old child who had transitioned male to female and who said something went wrong in my mother's belly. I was supposed to be a girl. And then they interviewed a 47-year-old trans woman who had just transitioned, and she said, I used to think I had the best of both worlds. I was a guy on the outside and a girl on the inside. But you know how God used to talk through burning bushes? She's updated her communications channels. She now uses the radio in a car wash where I didn't, couldn't get distracted. I had to hear that I needed to listen to my child. So that shook me up. I went back home. I said to my husband, wow, I slammed this door really hard on Will about four weeks ago. I think I have to reopen and I have to get educated and reopen it. And he said, I agree. Bye, I'm going to the Masons meeting. He took off to do his boy thing, and um, I called Will up from what we call the girl cave, lovingly. And Will comes upstairs, and I said, do you still feel like a girl on the inside and a guy on the outside? And Will said, no, why? And I said, well, I heard about these things on the radio called puberty blockers, and although you're well into puberty, I commit to you, if you want them, I will find a way to get them for you, and they are something that will pause time a little bit for us. And Will said, no, can I go back downstairs? And I said, yes, you can go back downstairs. And I congratulated myself on dodging that bullet and patted myself on the back for being a great mom, and I poured a martini. And two hours later, Will came upstairs and said, I want that thing that paused time. Will spent those two hours, I, heard, I, heard, I learned years later, wondering if this were a trick. Sitting in bed, Staring at the wall, thinking, is she setting me up to slap me down? Or is this really a chance? Is she really going to hear me? So, Will decided that if she slaps me down, I'm no different than I am now, and if this is a chance, I don't want to miss it. So that first year, I called everywhere I could get my hands on trying to find someone who could support my kid who wasn't on the periphery of the medical world and I couldn't find them. We were driving an hour south to a guy in Rockville who had treated one trans woman 10 years ago for, for um, uh, counseling. And I was driving an hour north in Bel Air to this, I, honest to God, this guy was an 88-year-old endocrinologist who was willing to put my kid on blockers, and I was praying that he would live to treat my child. That was, that was as close as I could get. I would spend the evenings in the big box stores in my car crying because I didn't want Will to see how hard it was for me. And I had to cry. And I promised myself, after a year, when I got into PFLAG and we finally found Chase Brexton, which is our local federally qualified health care center that supports LGBT people and children, um, I promised myself nobody else would ever spend that first year alone and wondering where to go for help. So that's when I started doing my trans work with PFLAG. And six years later, we've got like going up on 150 parents on our listserv. So it's really, really made a huge difference. So here's some facts and figures that are horrifying. Trans people attempt suicide at 25 times the rate of the general population. 40% of our kids have attempted suicide, not considered it, but attempted it by the time they're 18. The National Coalition of Anti-Violence Programs studied bias-motivated violence aimed at LGBT people over 13 years. This is the LGBT population. Trans people accounted for 20% of the murder victims, 40% of the victims of police-initiated violence. Our trans women of color are highly, highly, disproportionately affected by violence. We've lost a trans woman every month this, so far this year already here in the United States. That's not including all across the world. 
90% of trans kids report they do not face, feel safe at school. Nine in 10 of our trans children do not feel safe at school. Here's something to remember. Lots of kids are gender variant. I prefer gender creative. Lots of them grow up to be straight. Lots of them grow up to be gay. Some of them grow up to be transgender, right? If a cross-gender identity persists beyond the age of 10 to 13, it is extremely likely to be permanent. Although they represent a tiny portion of the population, trans people reflect the same wide spectrum of interests, personalities, religious affiliations, and sexual orientations as the entire population. Some are so shy they would be mortified if you knew their business, and others are fully out. I was working with a school who said, oh, we're fine, we have a trans kid, we had one a couple years ago, and we know, we know this, we know how to do this. And I said, really, tell me about the trans kid you had a few years ago. Oh, she was in theater, she was really flamboyant, she was totally out. And I said, well, this time you've got a really shy trans boy. So what you did for that flamboyant, out, theater-loving trans girl might not fit what this child needs, right? We have to keep in mind that trans is only one piece of who they are. There's a whole lot of other pieces that go to make us who we are. So transitioning, we talk about it in four processes, and it's really changing how you appear, so that how you appear matches your internal identity. So what I want to, I, we talk about it in four stages, but I want you to understand that A, not all trans people go through all four, they don't all start at one and go to two and then three and then four. They can jump around. They can get halfway there and stop. They can walk up and step back. They're human beings, right? And this is a process and it's a journey. Social transitioning, this is when we have a really small, very gender clear child who wants to socially transition at work. I don't want to be Sam anymore. I want to be Susie. That's clothing, hairstyles, pronouns, and name is really all that has to do with, right? There's also a pharmaceutical area of transitioning, and that's when we block the birth hormones and apply the cross-gender hormones that are in alignment with the gender identity. Surgical is surgically altering our bodies to conform to our gender identity. It may or may not include bottom surgery, which is where so many people tend to go immediately when they're talking to trans people, even Katie Couric, you know what's in your pants. Um, not every trans person gets bottom surgery. It's excruciatingly expensive. It's not always covered by insurance. Some people don't want it. Many people do want it and simply can't get it for whatever reason. Um, so that's why we have to be very careful not to have um, procedures or laws that are based on body parts because no one's going to panty check. That's just a ridiculous concept, right? What was that word before surgery? I'm not hearing this right now. Bottom surgery. Bottom surgery. As the bottom, yes, as a, I apologize. Top surgery would be if you have a trans boy, that's someone who was born with girl parts and identifies as a male, and if he has gone through puberty as a girl, top surgery would be to reconstruct the chest so it more aligns with his identity. For some trans girls, top surgery is breast implants. Bottom surgery is the bottom parts. And there is surgery available both for trans men and trans women, but it is horrifyingly expensive. You, you can buy a house in most of America for what it costs. And the final, it's a legal process of changing identification papers to match identity. All the way down, you know, some states don't allow you to change the gender marker on your birth certificate. Many do, thank heavens. Okay, so that's where I wanted to start. Hunter, do you want to tell your story first or watch a movie first? Okay, let's watch. We're